Hey, I'm Kyle Ladipo, and have you ever wondered what exactly a Docker layer is? To answer that question, we are going to dissect a Docker image layer by layer and learn what's inside. First, a recap. If our goal is to run a Docker container, we can create one as an instance of an image. And to obtain an image, we can either pull one from a registry, like the Docker Hub, or we can build one ourselves from a Docker file. You might have noticed that when you pull an image from the registry, it's not like downloading a single file. Instead, you'll be able to see that it's downloading multiple layers. A Docker image is made up of some metadata, such as the image's name and tags, and a sequence of read-only layers. Each layer contains a diff of the file system changes made by the Docker file instructions for that layer. When creating a container, these layers will be stacked and applied on top of each other, forming the container's file system. And when the container is started, an additional writable layer is added to the top of the stack, which allows the software running in the container to write to the file system, be that logs or cache or any other data that might be generated during the container's lifetime. We can get a better look at the image's metadata by running the docker inspect command. Docker inspect will give us a detailed JSON object with all of the information it can give us for any given Docker object. If we run docker inspect node LTS, we can see the image's metadata, including the layers. We'll get back a decent amount of information on the image, but let's focus on a few interesting fields. Repo tags is an array of the image's tags, including the one that we use to pull the image, like node LTS and repo digest is the unique identifier for that image. You might have referred to an image by its digest before to ensure that you don't accidentally have any changes between your image poles. This is a common thing to do in CI. Repo digests are also an array as they could contain multiple digests in the case of a multi-platform image. Command is the default command to run in the container when it has started, and it's the same as what you define in your Docker file. Architecture and OS are pretty self-explanatory, and you can see because I pulled the node LTS image from my Mac, the architecture is listed as ARM64. And now we start to get into the information relevant to layers. The graph driver refers to the storage driver used by the container runtime to store and manage the image layers. You can see the name of the driver here is Overlay2. Overlay2 is the default storage driver for Docker, and it takes advantage of the OverlayFS file system to perform most of the magic that we associate with Docker layers. OverlayFS is a union file system, meaning it has the ability to mount multiple file systems on top of each other and present them as a single file system. If we look at the graph driver's data field, specifically the lower dir field, we can see exactly where the image's layers are stored on the disk. For most systems, you'll find the layers stored on your local machine in the varlib docker overlay2 directory. The lower dir field is a colon separated list of directories, each representing a layer in that image. If we were to check out one of these directories, we could actually see that there's also a file within named lower. This contains a reference to the layer's parent layer, or the layer that came before it. You'll also see a diff directory which contains the file system changes made by the Docker file instructions for that layer. We can visualize this better by using a CLI tool called Dive. Dive is a terminal UI tool that will show us the file tree of the image's file system between each layer, and we can view the commands that created them. Install the Dive CLI and then run Dive node LTS. On the left, you'll see a list of layers with the command that created them. And on the right, we have the file system tree as it exists at that point in the image's history. We can make it a little easier to see what's happening by pressing the tab key to switch over to the file tree view and then hiding everything except the added files. We can do that by using the keyboard shortcut for each of the filters. If we tab back and move to the first layer with a run command, we'll start to see some of the more interesting file system changes. The first run step in the node LTS image creates both a group and a user named node with a GUID of 1000 and a UID of 1000 respectively. And in the file system additions, we can see that a new home directory was created for the node user. What we're looking at is the same content we found in the diff directory of the layer on the disk. So why are images stored as layers? Because those layers are read-only, we can reference the same layer across multiple similar images, saving disk space and download time when we pull an image. If you pulled down node LTS earlier, try pulling down an older version of the same image now, like node 18 for me, and you should see that most of the layers already exist on your machine, and only the last three layers in this case need to be downloaded. When you have layers available on your machine for the image that you are building or pulling, we call that a cache hit. 
And we generally do everything we can to get as many of those as possible. When Docker is building an image, it will cache the results of each instruction in the Docker file. And if the instructions and the files it references have not changed between builds, it will use the cache result again instead of trying to build it a second time. If something does change, Docker will invalidate the cache for that instruction and all subsequent instructions and start the build again at that point. To try and improve the rate of cache hits and speed up Docker builds, we can try a number of techniques like ordering the instructions in a Docker file in a way that minimizes the chance of changes happening early on in the build. We can also use a service like Depot's remote container builds, centralizing your builds with a persistent cache. Typically, on most ephemeral CI platforms like GitHub Actions, the runner is spun up to perform a job and then torn down when the job is complete, deleting any cache layers in the process. And even if you cache that manually to a blob storage, like the native cache action, you will need to download that cache to the runner in each job. Relying on downloading often large files in your CI pipeline can be slow or worse, flaky. With Depot, we can simply replace the docker build command with the Depot build command and start taking advantage of persistent cache that is shared across all of your builds and environments. You'll be able to take advantage of the same cache locally, even if you're building in CI. Using the Depot build command in CI environments can be up to 40 times faster than using the typical Docker command. We have a lot of great blog posts diving deeper into the inner workings of Docker layer caching and tips on how you can optimize your Docker builds on our blog. So please come check us out on Depot.dev. And if you have any questions, my name is Kyle, and I'll see you in our community Discord linked in the description. Happy building.